thank you for taking the time to attend today. Thanks go to City Channel 4 staff, Lily and Ty, for recording these presentations, to Shannon Balicki, Jackie and Alice for helping with this program. And of course, thanks go to each of our presenters today for their efforts to bring education and information to our program. I think we have a, a nice diverse set of topics for the CE today. So now I'm gonna turn the mic over to Linda and she's going to introduce each speaker. Thank you, Doug. It really is nice to see everyone here today, as Doug said, with part of your faces, but we appreciate that. Um, and thank you for attending in person. I would like the project coordinators to stand, so if you're a new Master Gardener, you can see who the project coordinators are and try and make efforts to uh, talk with them about their projects and how you might volunteer. So if you would just take a moment to stand up. Project coordinators. I, I know you're here. <laughs> Alice, thank you. A big hand of applause for you guys, too. In 2014, Nicole Pearson launched the local effort for Master Gardener Continuing Education. In 2019, when she moved to Wisconsin, Doug and I took on the program. So we're very excited to have this in-person program after a bit of a hiatus in 2020 and 2021, we, we came to you virtually. Our presenters will take questions after each of their presentations and you're going to be asked to step to this microphone so, you're, um, so our viewing audience can hear your questions as well. I'm so pleased to introduce our first speaker, Tyler Baird. I met him seven years ago when he arrived in Iowa City. His contributions have sparked innovations in the park and public spaces throughout the city. His, the departure from traditional gardening designs immediately transformed the city's natural environment into a greenscape sanctuary. Urban gardening is tough. The key is selecting the right plant species that cohabit in close proximity to produce a pleasing effect. Placing importance on the plant's architectural form, structure, and texture is critical, and color adds to the diversity. Tyler's appreciation moved Iowa's natives to the forefront and redefined the character of modern urban spaces in our city. His strategy, inspired by nature and ecology, boosts the growing exception, acceptance of the natural environment. His inspiration features perennials that change throughout the season, producing an effect that nature is flourishing. As the plants grow and patterns evolve, the gardens reflect constant movement, and I want my garden to look like his. <laughs> Tyler is a native Iowan. He is an Iowa State University alum who majored in landscape architecture and received his MS um, from Utah State University. He worked for the National Park Service in Western U.S. before returning to his home state in 2015. Now, as superintendent of Parks and Forestry, Tyler's perennial movement design highlights the living, changing spaces advanced by legendary plant artist and nurseryman Pete Odoof. Let's welcome Tyler. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me and the, the warm welcome, um, and Linda for <laughs> everything you've done downtown to help us with this movement. Uh, I met Linda, I think the second or third day I was on the job um, in Iowa City. Um, my position at that time was uh, kind of the uh, field supervisor for the horticulture operations, and she's been a big help, and I know a lot of you help her out as well around town, either on the downtown, um, projects or other places around. So we appreciate all you do as well. Let me pull up this quick. Okay. There we go. 
Awesome. So today we'll be talking to you about uh, um, perennial movement design, um, the role of native plants uh, in that. Um, I don't just use native plants, but native plants um, are kind of the, the ethos of this design style. Um, like Linda said, I'm superintendent of parks and forestry um, within the Parks and Recreation Department in Iowa City. And I've got my email address up there. If you have any questions that we don't get to or anything, I also brought some business cards. Um, you can see me after for those as well. So our objectives today um, are to identify new perennial approaches, um, discover um, perennial favorites. Maybe they're new to you. Um, maybe you've been using them for a while. Um, and then gain tips for um, really dynamic perennial gardens. So things that are going to be dynamic the year round. Um, so I also brought up here on the front table. These were all just cut yesterday from my home garden. So you can see there's, there's plenty abundance still um, in the garden even at this time of year. And those are a mix of uh, probably 60% native and then 40% uh, non-native, but, but plants that work well with those. So I'm gonna ask you this now, but I'll come back to it in a little bit. I'll give you a, a, a few uh, slides to think about it. Just kind of <laughs> want you to think about your favorite perennial. I know uh, I get asked my favorite plants a lot of times. Usually it's trees I'm asked, but, uh, but perennials as well. Um, there's a the long list, so just, uh, uh, think about what might be your favorite, and we might uh, get some shout outs in a little bit for those. So here's a little bit of my background. I put this up here because it, uh, it helps inform the work that I do, the places I've been, the other gardens I've seen, the other uh, um, uh, coworkers I've had um, have really uh, helped me um, uh, get to where I am today. Um, so started at Iowa State, um, background in landscape architecture, um, I worked at Ryman Gardens when I was there. Beautiful gardens there. If you, uh, um, if you haven't had a chance to get there, I'm sure most of you had. Um, I highly recommend going there. I spent some time uh, during undergrad at University of Idaho as well on an exchange. Um, did grad school at Utah State. Um, super long title, um, Human Dimensions of Ecosystem Science and Management. So <laughs> I think it's the longest in their book. Um, but really what that means is how people um, are using the, the spaces outdoors. Um, it was focused on outdoor recreation, kind of more so in the west there, but that can translate back to how we're using city environments or our parks as well. Um, worked for a little bit uh, with the National Park Service and Missouri State Parks, so kind of those more natural spaces um, before uh, um, coming uh, back to Iowa. I grew up in Tipton, so uh, um, just real close by. Um, really love this area. So um, one of the other things that brought me back really were the native plants, the prairie. Um, I love getting out in the prairie. Uh, this picture's from a seed harvest uh, last fall, um, just uh, not too far from here. Um, so uh, I really enjoy really the, really the colors, the textures, our native plants, the open landscape, um, just everything that's there. And like I said, I'm not the first one to do these things. Uh, we all do it a little bit differently, um, but here's just some pictures of some others to do that. Um, Linda had mentioned uh, Pete, uh, and he's, uh, he's on the top right there. Um, so he's kind of the expert, I guess, or the one that everyone kind of looks to. Um, but there were others as well. And I'm going to focus a little bit of the first part here on that uh, um, individual in the bottom left. That's Jens Jensen. He was uh, basically, he had my role a whole long time ago for the city of Chicago, so much larger scale. Um, so he was one of the first to do some of these things in the U.S. So here we see kind of what was thought of as the ideal garden. Um, what, when America started to um, make parks, um, everyone was trying to emulate um, what was in Europe. Um, so a lot of uh, um, high maintenance plants uh, spaced with formality, um, all of those things. Um, and this is one of Jens, Jensen's first gardens in Chicago, kind of his early work. And you can see it really follows kind of that, uh, that aesthetic. Um, but then he started to look, you know, 
right outside his door. This is a, a current picture um, in Chicago, um, but this is what it would have looked like around the city. Probably not as many tall buildings at that time, um, but prairies right in his backyard. So he took those, uh, those prairies and that inspiration and really started to, uh, to use that in his designs. Um, so, you know, naturalized plantings, you see here there's, it almost looks like uh, this was, you know, you go out and find a creek through the woods. Um, so designing in those ways, or in this, uh, this photo, um, uh, you've got kind of a reandering uh, stream with native plants and masses around them um, on all of the edges there. So he was one of the first to do um, really the design style, one of the first to embrace native plants, especially prairie plants. Um, so we can all thank him today for, you know, a lot of those staples we go to the, the nursery or greenhouse and, and find our, our thanks to him and promoting those. So we didn't just have um, all of the European um, plants that, that were seen as in fashion at that time. Then somewhere along the line, we, uh, we kind of shifted um, kind of mid-century. Um, and this uh, is a uh, award-winning garden, and there are a lot of good things about this garden. Um, this is also in Chicago by uh, uh, Dan Kiley. Um, but you see a lot more formality come in, not as many natives, even though the, the trees are native in this instance, um, but, but not a lot of variety in your, your perennials um, or your ground plane. Um, so this is one style, um, and it, it is successful, um, but this was kind of morphed into something that we can all see here. Um, I feel like it, it led to this anyway. You know, you, you have similar spacing. Your, your trees are spaced out. Your shrubs are spaced out. Um, but I would argue this doesn't add a whole lot visually or ecologically to our landscapes. And uh, McDonald's isn't the only one to do it. Uh, Wendy's does it as well. And this is probably the best these ever looked. Freshly mulched, uh, looks like they weren't planted too long before. Um, they probably don't look this good, you know, even a couple years down the road. Um, but I can't just pick on, on others. Uh, this is uh, at Cardigan Park in Iowa City um, after we had a redesign. And uh, um, we try to catch things in the design process. Um, uh, we don't do all the design work in-house on some of our projects, and uh, um, we, we do our best to uh, um, kind of improve them um, afterwards. But this, you can see there's some weeds in there, but, uh, um, you know, plants further spaced apart, a bunch of mulch, uh, not a whole lot of extra interest there. So you'll see this garden again in a little bit, and hopefully you'll see the improvement. This was uh, City Hall uh, in 2015-2016, uh, sometime around there. Um, you can see um, similar, um, just tired plantings that had been planted. You know, they probably looked good when they went in sometime in the 80s, early 90s, but uh, um, they were starting to get tired and aged out and uh, just kind of dying in a sea of mulch there. Um, and you've got a burning bush right behind the signs there, which. I beg you all not to plant as it's uh, become invasive uh, in our area. So getting back to uh, your favorite perennial, has anyone thought of one yet? Anyone want to shout one out? Got any takers? The peonies. Peonies, okay. How about over here? Butterfly bush. Or no, not butterfly bush. Butterfly weed. Butterfly weed, awesome. Yeah. Any others? Yeah. Daylily. Daylily lilies, okay. Yep. Coneflowers, hey, we got echinacea coneflowers, same right together. Awesome, well, we got some good ones there, and uh, a lot of those um, uh, I'll use in my, uh, my designs, um, especially some of those, those natives that you said, echinacea um, especially. Um, so my favorites all kind of get back to this, the, the prairie, um, the grasses, um, the forbs that, that are in masses, kind of that uh, clump together or add little highlights throughout the, the prairie. Um, and they do that all year long. This is a fall, fall picture again, but, uh, but this would change throughout the seasons. Um, so getting back to Chicago today, um, if you ever want inspiration and want to see how uh, the, uh, the really uh, um, experts that have a lot of extra um, money and, uh, and staff uh, do it, um, you can go to Chicago. They have a, a lot of very nice gardens there. Um, this one is the Lori Garden um, in Millennium Park. It is actually on top of a parking structure. Um, so when we're talking about tough plants, these plants are growing in um, soil that's all been brought in. 
um, and uh, there's there's not a, a a lot of extra help there. Um, you've got buildings surrounding, um, you know, uh, urban heat heat island effect. Uh, you've got all the Chicago winter weather that um, that's kind of crazy as well. So um, you can see if these plants are doing well here, they're probably going to do well for us in Iowa City downtown and the parks, but they'll also do well in, in your gardens with not as much upkeep and, and maintenance. This is also Chicago. This, uh, this is by Roy Diblick. His photo was also on one of those first slides and he has a, a great uh, book called The No Maintenance Approach to Perennial Gardening, No with uh, K and O W. Um, so he's another great um, resource out there and he uh, um, he's based out of uh, just over the line into uh, um, Wisconsin um, from the Chicagoland area. So he's also kind of that space. So you can see kind of how, how they were doing it there. Um, so now I'm gonna take you through some slides that kind of show the plant material. Um, that's what I'm gonna focus on um, uh, for the first part here. And I'll uh, not just include those, what you would traditionally think as perennials, like those herbaceous perennials, but I'm gonna include some shrubs as well, which, um, which will work well in these plantings. So first up here, um, we have a native, we have nine bark. Um, so this one um, would be a cultivar or a native R of it. Um, the, the red color kind of tells you that. I believe this is summer wine, the variety, but there are a lot of good varieties out there. Native, it would be green, um, but, uh, but the nursery industry has, has um, you know, enhanced some of those colors. So this is a great, great native. You can't really go wrong. If you cut it down, it'll grow right back up. Um, it makes a good uh, um, screen or um, kind of highlight, uh, especially with that color in the garden. Um, so this is one that I, I use quite often. If you have a wetter location, uh, this is button bush, and you can see that, that beautiful uh, um, button-shaped uh, flower on there. Um, really full of pollinators, all of those little individual um, uh, parts of the flower, um, they're, they're always um, all over that. So bees, butterflies, uh, even ants, a little bit of everything will crawl on those. So another, another good uh, plant, um, especially if you have a little bit wetter spot in your yard. Here's one of my favorites, and we got a monarch on there enjoying as well. Um, this is oak leaf hydrangea. So we're all probably familiar with the, uh, um, the uh, just typical hydrangea you'll see, but uh, I found that oak leaf's a little bit tougher um, and does a little bit better um, for me. Um, I've got one right outside my office window that the birds love. The sparrows are, are in and out of it all day long um, and uh, other birds and, and insects as well. And this will keep those flower heads throughout um, the year as well and they change color. Um, as they go. And you can find short ones, medium sized ones, really big ones. So for just about any garden, you can find one that works. This next one is arrowwood viburnum. So um, I like viburnums. They're, they're good native um, with arrowwood. Um, you've got these, these blooms at this time of year. Um, they've got great fall color. Um, and uh, they make a good screen. I've got some along my yard that are uh, kind of a screen between um, my yard and my neighbor's yard, um, but they're, uh, they're just good for um, you know, pollinators and, and habitat as well. Uh, in that same row, um, to diversify a little bit at home, I have a common witch hazel. So this is going to be a large shrub or a small tree. Um, yeah, I like the multi-stem version, um, at least in a home garden. Um, so you can see this was the last thing to bloom in the fall. Um, so this picture was probably sometime in beginning of November of last year. You have a few of the, the yellow leaves hanging on and then you've got those, those really cool yellow flowers that some of the last pollinators that are out for the season are going to be enjoying. Uh, Fothergilla, um, this is another, um, as fall, um, you can see really great uh, fall color on this one. Um, a little bit smaller, um, maybe not quite as tough. So if you have a, a tougher location, we tried some downtown and uh, they didn't do quite as well. I think it was maybe a little too hot or dry for them, but, but in most home gardens, they would, they would do really well. 
um, keep the rabbits off of them. This one did not look as good the, the year after I planted it because uh, the rabbits got to it. Another great, uh, um, great shrub that uh, adds some uh, different colors and textures throughout the season is bottle brush buckeye. So just like a buckeye, it'll get that little seed, um, or not little, but big seed with a husk around it. Um, and then you also have a, uh, a nice uh, um, white flower, like panicle flower at part of the, the season. And I believe I have it in some, um, some pictures in a little bit as well. So that's kind of the, the go-to shrubs, I would say, um, that uh, I use at home around the, the city and that I've seen done successfully in other gardens. Um, there are others as well. If you, want, uh, if you want just a good green backdrop and you have a shady spot, just a standard traditional U would work. Um, so we use some of a little bit of everything, but, th but these are really my go-tos. <coughs> So if you read Roy Diblick's book or anything by, by Pete Adolf, um, you'll, you'll see sedges um, focused on a lot. And what sedges do really well, um, well, a few things. They, they cover the ground in between your plants, uh, work as a, um, like a living mulch, if you will. Um, they keep some green throughout the season. So this is a winter, um, winter photo of uh, Pennsylvania sedge. Um, but not just Pennsylvania, there are so many sedges out there. Um, you can find sedges that work in almost every type of situation. So you've got uh, anything from dry and sunny to uh, wet and shady and everything in between. So, so there's probably a sedge that works for you out there. Um, different heights, colors, textures, seed heads, all of the above. Um, Pennsylvania sedge, though, is a, a good one that grows in a lot of um, areas. So. Um, that's why I've kind of highlighted it here. Little blue stem. I've got some in the, the cuttings up here. Uh, it, it keeps a good form throughout the winter. Um, this is a fall photo. It's got a little bit of uh, red color um, in this instance with that, that white airy seed head that's really nice. So um, this is a good prairie native um, that's not too tall. Um, so if you have a, a smaller home garden, it's not going to take over or, or be the spotlight, but kind of like those sedges, it'll, it'll fill some of those spaces in between. Another good one, uh, blue grandma grass, um, uh, sort of native. Uh, <laughs> depends on what you consider native, but uh, it would be native to the U.S. Um, and this cultivar here is called blonde ambition grass. Um, but I found one that I like even better now called Honeycomb. Um, it just has a little bit more um, lasting power through our, our colder winters. Um, so if we get a cold year, it will do better. Um, but very nice uh, um, plant. There's some here. Um, another cultivar that I've heard of that doesn't do quite as well is called Angel's Eyelashes. So you can kind of see they, they look kind of like eyelashes. They're, very whimsical and fun and have some of that movement with the wind and, and the textures um, that really add to things. Another grass here is switchgrass. So switchgrass is, is uh, um, another good, a little bit taller um, plant. Um, I tend to stick with, if I want a taller version, Northwind is the variety or cultivar. And if I want a shorter one, I'll go with Shenandoah. Shenandoah has better fall color, nice and red, um, but doesn't get as tall. Um, and the uh, uh, north wind has really good green throughout the year and throughout the summer. But you can see even in the winter um, with snow on it, it can look really pretty, those textures playing off the, the white of the snow. Um, so those were kind of the, the go-to grasses. Other ones I'll use are um, Big blue stem. Uh, some of the breeders out there are coming up with some good cultivars of those, um, and uh, Indian grass as well. And what some of those cultivars get you um, is uh, a little less tendency to spread at times. Um, so uh, some of the um, the just straight species natives um, can tend to spread, which is great in a lot of our instances. If it's spreading around the gardens, I know it's, it's tough and hardy, and uh, um, maybe it's filling a space. There's nothing wrong with going in, digging out something you don't want in one spot and uh, dealing with it that way, dividing it up, bringing it to your plant sale, um, whatever it may be. Um, 
So uh, those are the grasses um, that I would recommend. Um, and then we'll kind of go through some others here. So we're getting some of the, the pretty colors now. Um, my favorite genus of, uh, of plants, so if you were asking me that question, I would say allium or ornamental onion, um, common name. So this one is a, uh, a, a newer, um, uh, just younger, I, I would say, um, uh, summer beauty allium. Um, so this one is not one of the native ones, but we do have native ones out there um, called nodding onion. Um, so uh, th they're almost, you know, the same color, um, and they'll have kind of a, a crook in the um, the stem right below the uh, the bloom, like one of these has on it. So some of those same characteristics. But a lot of good ornamental onions out there. Millennium's another great uh, cultivar. Um, they bloom. Uh, quite a while in the summer, I always have pollinators on them, have that nice pink color um, as well. So here is Rattlesnake Master. Um, so why I like Rattlesnake Master is uh, above all else, the form that it gives. It's got a cool name too. Um, and then uh, it's always, uh, here's another picture, it's always full of pollinators on these, uh, um, these flower heads. Um, throughout uh, throughout the fall. So of, of a plant that doesn't have a really showy bright flower, it probably has the most pollinators of any others. And this is another great uh, prairie native. Um, that picture of me in the prairie that day, um, I found a bunch of these to, uh, to save some seed on as well. And someone over here uh, mentioned uh, butterfly weed. Um, a, great, uh, a great milkweed if you're looking for one that's not going to uh, um, be quite as, uh, um, uh, I don't know, I, wanna, I don't want to say invasive, but quite as uh, aggressive as, uh, as your common milkweed might be. This one's not going to spread as fast, um, but uh, the butterflies like it just as much. Actually, I feel the younger ones um, have a lot more smaller leaves, and I've noticed um, caterpillars on those even more than the common milkweed, it seems like. so. Um, that's a good one that has really the, the color is what, what sells you on this one. Um, so it'll be a, a middle of the summer, um, bright pop of yellow for or yellow and orange because some of the even native ones um, uh, have a more yellow um, cast to them. And, and I know they sell more of the yellow varieties now as well. So I don't have a great picture of this one. I haven't tried it as much um, in the garden. It's a good prairie um, plant though. Um, I planted a bunch of these plugs that you see here last year at home. I'm testing them out. It's a, it's a good one for uh, Johnson County area if, if you're a Hawkeye fan. It's got black and gold flowers. <laughs> Something to, uh, um, to add some black and gold that's, <clears throat> excuse me, not just uh, um, your traditional black eyed Susan. So to add some black and gold diversity there. <clears throat> So as you can see on that tag there, it gets a little taller as well. <clears throat> so probably my favorite of the non-natives in here, but a, a plant that um, if you're going to use a non-native that uh, fits kind of that, that prairie aesthetic, the textures, the, um, the colors, the movement, uh, the good pollinator habitat um, is calament. Um, so it's, uh, it's always full of bees, um, has a, a very uh, um, strong smell, really. Um, some people like it, uh, some people don't like it as much. I, I kind of enjoy it. Um, the bees, uh, you see a few on there, obviously enjoy it. Um, but if this was a video of it, you would hear all the buzzing around. So tons of small um, pollinators, bees, uh, um, native bees and wasps. Um, I really love, love this plant. And it'll stay blooming until you know, it's frosted a few times. It even gets more of a purple um, color on the, uh, um, the petals as it has more time into the fall and frost. But it'll start blooming sometime in, in July usually and kind of go on from there. And in the spring, it's really nice too because it's this bright green color and almost has a, a ball shape. Um, when it's, it's growing, um, so it's, it's kind of got more of a formal look at that time of year. 
and also short enough that that makes a good edge planting. So um, a lot of times uh, our, our natives, we don't have as many short ones um, because in the prairie they, you know, unless they were a really early bloomer. Um, so this one kind of fills that niche that I haven't found um, as many natives to, to fill. Here's another winter image. Uh, this is just a seed head of uh, Joe Pieweed. So you can see that that seasonality is something I, I really look for when selecting plants. Um, this has a little bit of frost on it and it, it really even adds, adds more to it, I think. Um, and you can get shorter varieties. This is just the, the straight native here. So this was taller than me um and this uh this plant but you can get a one called little joe and there's other varieties as well that'll stay oh need a waist height and if you have a big garden um, another uh, uh big one you might want to try um, i haven't used these as much in town but this is from my my home garden um, it's compass plant um, you need a lot of other plants around it to keep enough structure so it doesn't tend to fall over unless you want to do staking. Um, but uh, this would be a good native uh, prairie plant. Um, you can see it's called compass plant. You can even see on the leaves there, they face uh, um, north and south. They point north and south. Um, so it's always getting sun throughout the day. Um, it's a really cool plant. And then if you're looking for some shadier um, spots, maybe you have a lot of shade in your garden, um, these next plants will be, be some for that. So wild geranium, um, this picture is over at Rochester Prairie. Um, so these are some, some natives uh, in the uh, savanna there um, that are really a lot of good color in the spring. Uh, make another good one to sell at your plant sale because it's usually blooming right around then. Um, so it's a, it's a nice plant as well. Probably my favorite uh, wood, um, woodland um, uh, perennial would be white wood aster because um, you get that, that fall color in your, um, your woodland planting. And uh, um, you know, you, you've got a lot of greens that work well in the uh, shade, but not as many things that bloom. Um, this you can see has a little bit of yellow and uh, then the pinkish red. Um, mixing with that, that white of the petals, um, so it makes a nice contrast. It, uh, um, the vegetation is a little bit lower throughout the season, and then these seed heads shoot up and make these, uh, these nice uh, colors. Um, and I've got a few of those in the bundle there, too, that uh, um, really keep almost some of those petals uh, throughout the winter, or that kind of that, that structure beneath the petals that looks nice. One that goes with that, this is, I apologize, not the greatest photo, but for some reason, when this one blooms earlier in the spring, I'm not taking as many photos usually. Um, it's one of the only things that really is, is uh, tends to be blooming in these few weeks that it's uh, at peak, but uh, um, Bowman's root, um, you can't see as well here, but where it's really bright in the photo, there's a little, um, a really uh, dainty uh, flowers um, that are, are kind of at the top of it, and this will do well in the shade too, um, and kind of, uh, um, I pair it with the white wood aster um, fairly often. Um, there's some of this at City Hall downtown, um, along with wood aster, and where we couldn't get things to grow as well, these have reseeded and, and filled in, so it's, it's done really well for us. But then, during the spring, before all of these uh, pop up, um, we have Glory of the Snow. Um, so this is a good thing, just kind of to bridge that gap to get you all excited about what's to come in the, uh, the year. So these will be popping up pretty quick, actually. Um, and I could do a whole talk on the maintenance of these spaces, um, but I'll just briefly touch on it here. We don't mulch our spaces, um, typically. Um, but we mow them each year, either with a mower set really high or with a uh, um, weed eater um, and go around each plant, being careful not to get into the crown of the plant. And then we let that material lie around them and it becomes a natural mulch. Um, so uh, it's, it's a lot better for the plants than, uh, if you think about it, most plants didn't grow in, in you know, chunks of wood, tiny chunks of wood that tend to drown them out, but they did grow in their own you know, plant matter, leaf matter, things like that, um, which is really evident in a prairie as it starts to uh, um, you know, 
lose its height at this time of year and, and break down. Um, so a lot of these plants do really well. And, and this plant will especially does really well to um, right after you cut things down for a couple weeks, it doesn't look as as great because it's, it's kind of sad to see all the texture you have in the winter go for a couple of weeks and, and then you see this color come in and that's always always a good, good thing. I like daffodils as well. Um, deer don't eat them. <laughs> that's kind of their biggest thing. Uh, little critters don't dig them up. Um, so I don't use as many tulips. They, they don't tend to last as long. Um, I don't have anything against tulips, but I don't like to having to plant them every year and, and everything. But daffodils will, um, will kind of naturalize and, and uh, continue to grow. So another good, good one, not, uh, not a native, but, uh, but we'll uh, add some color in that, that first part of the year. So now I'm gonna get into a few combinations of, of plants that uh, um, really worked well together in textures and colors and things like that throughout the season. Um, so in the back there is a yellow bulb allium. And in the front, Arkansas blue star. This one is blue ice, one of the shorter varieties. Um, so Arkansas blue star, not native to Iowa, but it is native to the Midwest. Um, so uh, I would say it's, it's kind of uh, almost part of the native club. Um, but a, a great plant, uh, this variety and others you'll see in, in follow-up photos. You can do the same thing with a couple other plants if you like that blue and yellow um, color scheme. Um, so this is catmint and uh, uh, one of the uh, yellow yarrows. Um, so uh, yarrow native, catmint not, but they're working really well together here to create some texture and, uh, and color. And then you see in the back there, there's some of that Joe Pye weed, just, uh, it's already pretty tall at that time of the year, um, but uh, adding some more of that coarse texture behind there is kind of nice as well. So a couple of you mentioned coneflowers or echinacea. Um, so this is one that's uh, um, kind of a selection or was found um, growing uh, in Tennessee, um, uh, native, and it has a little bit different form. I've Tried this one out at home and liked what I've seen, so I may use a little bit more of this one. Um, not quite like the, uh, all of the purple coneflowers you'll see in the um, nursery centers. Um, those have been bred, rebred so many times, either the purples, the pinks, the white ones. Um, I just don't see them lasting as long in the gardens. So something like this that was a selection of a native um, or a, a native that uh, um, was propagated um, from those native seeds um, tends to do a little bit better. It's a little hardier. Um, and uh, you can also use uh, pale purple coneflower, um, which we'll see in some photos coming up here, um, which would have been the one that was native to Iowa. And then you've got yarrow. So this is an example of using um, the other kind of yarrow or the other color of yarrow. Um, so pink with pink can be kind of nice. So playing with your colors, your textures, remembering your bloom times, it's, it's all quite complex when you uh, really drill down into it. But uh, um, trying to think of all those things, think of what grows fast and, uh, and what might not and how the garden changes throughout the year and, and height and color and texture, all of those things. So here's getting to a little bit more complex uh, um, planting. So you've got a few things here. So mixing textures once again, this is in the fall. You see the, uh, um, the calumet in the back has some of that, that purple color I was talking about before. But then you've got nice, uh, um, the native uh, prairie drop seed, another great native grass there in the middle with Arkansas Blue Star, one of the other varieties um, up front there. So you got some nice yellow fall color and, and more texture as well. Then this isn't one of my plantings, but this is at a um, garden in Wisconsin. So you can see if you have a shady spot, you can go pretty, pretty simple, but still have color and texture. So there's some U in the background for that, that backdrop. Um, a couple of different kinds of hosta. 
Um, I don't use a ton of hosta, but, uh, but they are nice to fill in. Um, they've got a more coarse texture, but then when you got some of those, those white edges on the one in the background is nice. And in this instance, the, the wild ginger is being used kind of like uh, the sedge would also be to fill in the space around things to keep down on weeds, and it, it does really well in the shade. So here you see that nodding onion. This is a native. Um, it's really cool the way it, uh, it kind of bows over like that. And uh, it'll stand up a little bit more as it uh, starts to uh, bloom, but the, the bloom will look like a circle, but if you get up real close to it, um, that globe's kind of coming off of the, the curve of it as well. Then you, once again, you see some of that butterfly weed in the background and, and catmint in the foreground. Um, so once the allium starts to bloom, you'll have the pink. So you got pink, orange, and purple all in this one little area. Kind of continuing on with the, the alliums, everyone kind of thinks of alliums as the, the bulb ones. So you've got those, you know, those gladiator ones that are almost as big as your head, um, or this size is uh, purple sensation. Um, so you've got uh, um, all the different sizes of that. I like it, it adds some whimsy to the garden. Um, and uh, Catman in the background, and then a, a great uh, native in the foreground there, um, uh, false indigo. Um, you can get wild white indigo, which is more native. Um, it, it doesn't have as much um, vegetation at the base, but it still sends up nice white uh, um, panicles of, uh, of color. Like this one is one of the um, recent cultivars that's got a purple end uh, at the base with that, that nice yellow coming off of it. So once again, using those, those colors that complement each other, those yellows and purples in this instance. Um, butterfly weed in the foreground again. Um, and then another one I haven't talked about, betony. Um, that's a, a great one that uh, um, I don't cut it back after it blooms. Um, I like to leave the little um, seed heads up top where those, those purple are there. Um, and it, it'll stay like a coarse texture throughout the whole winter. And then it's not blooming yet in this uh, photo, but I, a lot of times I'll kind of let Prairie Blazing Star um, kind of seed and run wherever it wants as well. Um, it creates some uh, upright uh, vertical structure and those will have that, that next wave of purple that will just overlap with the betony a little bit. So here you can see um, oak leaf hydrangea kind of uh, early on. Um, so one of those shrubs to add some of that uh, base to things and that coarse texture. Um, I don't mind iris, just traditional iris in the background. If you have some of those, you can always split them up, move them around. Um, they've got nice color when they're blooming as well. Um, once again, there's blazing star here, cat mint and butterfly weed. And then one little rattlesnake master popping up in the background there. Here's a little bit more complex uh, um, uh, planting, um, a little less uh, size to each of the groupings. So when you really drill into a, a close up like this, um, you see a lot of different colors and textures. So here's that prairie blazing star blooming. Um, there's some autumn joy sedum right behind that, that uh, um, you know, that's, that's something that everyone probably knows here. It's not a native, but it adds some good structure, so um, it's not gonna hurt uh, to add that in um, with, the, with the natives. You see that fine texture of this, uh, um, this Arkansas blue star that's here. Um, some of the others have a coarser texture. You've got some of that, that purple or pink just starting to bloom with the uh, summer beauty allium, and then uh, rattlesnake master again, and then um, the uh, fireworks goldenrod. I don't necessarily recommend most goldenrod because they can take over, but this one called fireworks, I, I've had uh, good luck with, um, and it puts on quite the show in the fall, as you'll see in a couple of slides. I prefer Siberian iris. Um, uh, if I'm planting iris, so here you see, uh, you know, it's not native, obviously, but um, it really works well. It almost looks like a grass once it's done blooming, and I like that, that texture. So there's some Carl Forster grass in the middle there that uh, has a similar um, kind of leaf shape and, and form at this time of year um, when this was taken. Um, and uh, you can just kind of see some of those other layers going back into the garden. So thinking about it from if there's a spot like this is at my house near uh, um, 
near my driveway and kind of front yard. So these are the levels um, going back. This is what I come home to. I like to see all the, the different colors and it kind of invites you in as, as you uh, um, kind of move into the garden. So here's that fireworks goldenrod I promised uh, you on the left there. Um, really great in the fall. Um, the bees love that as well. Um, one of those grasses I don't get a lot of good pictures of is Indian grass. It just kind of adds some height in the background here. And there's some big blue stem on the other end in the background. Um, that one I believe is uh, either Red October or Black Hawks uh, variety. And then there's some Black Eyed Susan. You've got those darker seed heads there. Um, and then uh, just some of those others we've talked about. You can even see after butterfly milkweed, bottom left there is done blooming. It adds some nice uh, um, green throughout the rest of the year. So those were kind of spots around um, other gardens and my garden, but now we'll go through quickly some of the, uh, um, the areas around Iowa City that you may have seen and where we've used these plantings. So this was one of the first, well, probably the first uh, planting in this style um, uh, we did once I started in Iowa City. This is the medians on Washington Street. So it's just up from City Hall. Um, this was before we had um, the same number of staff we've, we've been able to uh, build to now. Um, we used uh, volunteers from City Hall. Some of them don't have windows in their offices, so they were more than happy to get out for an afternoon and help us plant uh, plugs. I believe Linda was there to help us plant that day too. Um, so really, uh, uh, we planted a, a large stretch there in, in a really short amount of time. They actually caught up to me as I was laying them out because um, they were so uh, efficient with their work. And uh, this has some of those plants we, we've talked about already, um, pale purple coneflower, um, the sedge there. Um, we've even got bulbs in the spring. There's a lot of daffodils that pop up. Um, there's coreopsis, which I haven't talked as much about. Got a bit of a love-hate relationship with it. It either grows well for me or not at all. Um, it's not one that's gonna last as long in your garden probably, but if, if you're uh, willing to add it um, every three or four years back in again, it can be a good one. Um, but this really just invites you up that, that hill um, up from City Hall. Another early planting we did, we were planting a bunch of annuals in City Park near the big parking lot. And uh, I wanted to try something different uh, um, rather than having, you know, annuals are only good for a certain amount of the year. Um, they don't have, uh, um, they don't fill in as quickly. They cost money each year to plant new ones. Um, so we took some of these plants, the, the purple coneflowers there came from Chauncey Swan Park before it was redesigned. So we reused those plants. Same with the Carl Forrester grass there. Um, you can see uh, salvia, one that I haven't talked as much about, but a perennial salvia in the foreground there um, as well. You can see a little bit of the shrub po popping up there um, with, uh, with some nine bark, which I believe is yep, on the next slide. This is just a, a different time of year in that same garden. Um, so you can see that, that nine bark I talked about earlier is a pop of color and structure. Um, as well as some of the summer beauty alley I'm up front there. Um, purple prairie clover, um, that will uh, kind of spread and, and do its own things, but it's, it's a good, uh, um, nice purple color. That's also in that, that median I showed you a little bit ago on Washington Street. Um, bees love those as well. So as I promised, I'd, I'd show you kind of what, what this turned into by City Hall. Um, I'm sure some of you have been by recently, but uh, um, this was, this project was like four years ago, most of it was planted. Um, so here it is, I believe this was last summer or the summer before. Um, you got the bottle brush buckeye with some of those, those white blooming panicles there on the left. Um, that nine bark again, there's bayberry in the background there, which you'll see on the next slide as well. Um, an, another shrub I haven't talked about yet. You got some height with the Joe Pye weed there on the, the top left. But then just mixing in all those other colors and textures and everything in the foreground, um, you see some of the names of them on there, um, but really just creating those levels and uh, kind of pockets of color. So here's from the other direction. Um, this kind of shades or shields that uh, the parking lot that's there from, from the view on Washington Street as well. 
Um, so this is a really nice place. A lot of city employees on their breaks will go out and, and enjoy this area. I, I get comments quite a bit from some of them about seeing bees and everything out there. Um, our city manager's office is in the, the building right there, kind of overlooking it as well. So um, it, it gets a lot of view from a lot of different angles. Um, most employees kind of walk in this corner of the building as well. Um, so it's kind of a nice, nice space there. Um, farmers markets right across the street as well. So um, as uh, more gatherings happening at that again, I'm sure there'll be more people milling around by this. Also at City Hall, here's a planting that kind of shows you can use just a few species and uh, come up with something that, uh, um, that's pretty dynamic. Of all of the plantings we've done, I probably get the most questions or comments or, or likes about this one. This is kind of that berm space um, by the corner of uh, um, Washington and uh, um, I'm blanking on the, the street there, but. <laughs> Gilbert, thank you, Washington and Gilbert. Um, so you'll see the, the sedge that I talked about before, filling the space in between things. Um, you got summer beauty allium, and then we, we put some bulb alliums in there as well, which adds that same repetition of the allium shape, um, but blooms a little bit earlier as well. So once again, here's the, uh, the space at Cardigan. This was our first uh, um, park that had a um, a fire pit in it. Um, so planting is kind of natural there because uh, you, you've got uh, a lot of people using that space and kind of gathering there for a longer amount of time. But like I say, this didn't have uh, a lot of desirable um, features in it. You do see some nine bark there and some Carl Forrester, which were kind of the beginnings of what we worked with. And this is what we turned that into. Um, my staff gets all the credit for this one. They took extra plants from our other planting projects over a two to three year period, and this is where we added them in. So they just kind of had fun naturally going, uh, um, going out there and, and placing them um, how they thought would look best, um, learning from what they were seeing in the other gardens. So um, they had, uh, you know, they had no formal training on this planting style, um, but they were able to, to replicate this um, just by uh, kind of seeing and um, seeing what worked well for them. So um, that's what I would suggest to all of you. Every yard, yard garden is going to be a little bit different. So figuring out works, what works well for you, what fits your style, and really building off of that. Um, this one's uh, also nice in the winter. Um, so you've got that, that texture that stays um, throughout the year. Um, so this is one of my, my more, more favorite spaces we've, we've done as well um, and created. This picture here shows spacing. So I'm not going to get a whole lot into that part of uh, the design process, but what I would say is throw the tag away. Don't follow the spacing on the tag. Um, that spacing is great if you want to mulch space all around your plant, but um, I don't personally like to see a sea of mulch. I like to see more plants working together to fill in that space, keep down on the weeds. So in this instance, uh, you see they're, they're really close together, 15, 18 inch on center at, at most typically. If you get something really big, maybe it's, it's 20 to 24 inches, but, um, but you kind of see that there. And this is on um, Clinton Street downtown, um, really tough location, gets salt spray all winter and everything else, but, but these plants have done really well for us. This is the second stretch of median on Washington Street. This is getting further east, kind of. There's, there's a few sororities in the neighborhood up here. Um, we were just mowing this space. It was a, a turf space that the turf was failing and um, not adding much of anything. So. Um, we decided to add, add plants here, and it's actually less time and maintenance than mowing it every week. Um, but there again, you see some of those combinations of plants. And this is probably my favorite of the median spaces we've done. And this takes a beating. I mean, some of the big parking lots there dump their snow on it in the winter, and it pops back every year. We'll, we'll add some in each year, but, but um, all of the, uh, the bones of it really stay, and we're just adding a few things each year. 
And we're getting towards the end here. This is another planting style we have tried. Um, so one of the, the first images with the, the other people of inspiration, um, Austin Eyshide was on there. Um, he was at Iowa State the same time I was, and he does uh, um, horticulture design in Chicagoland area now. And what he tried at Midwest Ground Covers um, was in their trial garden, um, taking their, um, their evergreen trial garden and adding grasses and sedges around them instead of using mulch there. Um, so this is what we've tried to emulate on Iowa Avenue here. Um, and as the evergreens start to grow with age, it'll get even better. But this is the, the crew planting these. Um, and uh, you see, once again, these are spaced slightly further apart, but, uh, but some of these grasses uh, get a little bit bigger here. And we had all different sizes from gallon pots to plugs to um, four inch pots. And you see by the fall, it didn't really matter which size it was. Um, I'd say whatever's available to go with, that's what we did here because this is that first fall and this is how fast that's grown in already. You see some of the, the way the different grasses and textures work together. Um, and I kind of like this, uh, you know, we added some Black Eyed Susans in, um, kind of uh, highlighting the, uh, the city's uh, um, flower, um, that black and gold color. I don't use a lot of them together because they can have some health issues if they're all in one place, but dotting them throughout has been successful. This same garden kind of further up, um, up the, uh, the way, the old capital would be right behind the, uh, the view of it, behind that tree there. And then this is the second spring. So you can see, uh, or the spring directly following planting. So you can see even that, that first, um, first year of establishment really got that and those roots going well and it's really filled in. Um, so like I said, Allium is my favorite. Genus, uh, I just uh, uh, like uh, like the way they are. There's, like you say, there's the nodding onion, which is the native, but also some of the others are good non-natives that work well and add that and that texture and um, aesthetic of the prairie to it as well. So if you guys have questions, I can take those now, um, but thank you all. Yes. Oak leaf hydrangea and the other hydrangeas, do you need to be concerned about acidifying the soil like you do many hydrangeas? I don't on those, and most of them have a, a white flower anyway, um, so it's not going to affect the, the flower color. Um, they've got a white, like a white with a pink color coming through it, so they, that's what they would do naturally. So they do a little bit better in our soil conditions. Yeah, good question. Others? Yeah, can, are we coming around to the mic? Is that right, Linda? Perfect. Hi, Tim, how you doing? Good. The, um, you were talking about the Pennsylvania sedge. Mm -hmm. How close would you plant them together then if you were doing like a horseshoe type, um, you know, uh, yeah. area? Yep, so the Pennsylvania sedge, I, I would tend to plant 15 inches on center, um, maybe a little bit less. Um, I know it's gonna cost you more up front for the plant material, but you're going to enjoy it a lot quicker and not have to do as much weeding. So um, somewhere around 15 inches. Um, you could go even less if you wanted to, but I wouldn't go much more than that. Good question. Thank you. Yeah. Now, I, I'm wondering about the, uh, the park with the f fire pit. Where is that? Yeah, good question. So Cardigan Park is on the far east side of town. It's uh, um, just kind of the north northeast corner of the Windsor Ridge area. Okay. Kind of not too far off Court Street. Yeah, good question. Did you, just, did you spell that part? Yeah, Cardigan like the sweater, okay. C-A-R-D-I-G-A-N. Yep. I have a question. A lot of those um, plants I didn't recognize. There were several that I did, but where do you get these plants? <laughs> I mean, what is your source? Do you get them locally or do you get them um, um, the online stuff? Or? 
Yeah, so to source plants, uh, all of the above, pretty much. Um, I would say landscaping tends to have a lot of these. I see on on their lot, and they've they've added a lot more natives lately to their selection as well. Um, I've got a few online. Um, uh, Prairie Nursery is kind of my go-to online source. Um, the ones we buy for the city plantings tend to come wholesale, um, either from uh, Midwest ground covers or intrinsic perennials. Um, those aren't available to you know just okay. the general homeowner, but most of the garden centers around buy from those places as well. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so anything you saw in my garden at home came from a local source. Okay. I mean. Even Lowe's sometimes has, you know, some good native plants or, or hardy plants. Just get them before they've sat around too long. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Well, that's all we got. Thank you again for having me and enjoyed it.